of governative organization uh, of uh, ACLI and uh, CELIM, which is also another non-profit organization, and uh, the University of Milan, uh, in the person of mine and uh, some other colleagues, particularly dedicated to the implementation of uh, food, uh, um, food products. And there, there is also as a partner the CAP, which is uh, Consorzio dell'Acqua Potabile di Milano, which is the most dedicated to the part of uh, provide, how providing water in this kind of uh, dry lands. The context uh, is uh, on the mountains, like Ipia Permaculture Center is over 2,000 meters over the sea. So it is a mountain, it's a very different mountains uh, compared to this one, of course. It is a very dry land on the Rift Valley. So the context is different, but of course we share some criticism, some perspectives, and the, 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 the opportunity to have Joseph here to share uh, some uh, experience and some of the project is very important for me. So I'm very happy to, to, to leave the, the stage to you. Okay, Joseph, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. One. Okay. This one. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. It's not sharing. <laughs> Just wait for sharing the screen with the people which is connected. No problem. Mm Here we go. Thank you. Good. Uh, okay. I sit there to mm. take some pictures. Very nice. Um, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Lentinoy, as uh, Angela told you. I'm from Kenya, and uh, I'm visiting Italy for a co collaboration of uh, um, the university and uh, the IPSIA, which is in Milan, to, 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 to see a few things and study and share my experiences. but. <clears throat> We've been running this project, which is now ending at the end of this month, uh, nearly three years and uh, two or three months. But the project um, title is Farming the Future Project. Um, that's the title. And uh, the partners uh, is the DONA, Italian Agency for Development Cooperation. And then the theme of the project is Sustainable Value Chains in Agriculture for Arid and Semi Arid Land. That's the meaning of. ASAL. We live in the region where it's really dry um, for many, many months. We just got the rains after two years. And then it's implemented by Ipsia as the lead partner. Selim is also a, an Italian NGO which is involved in ensuring that uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure of the project is done. That's ourselves, like Ipsia Permaculture Center, the logo which is round. CAP is an um, uh, Italian water company that was involved in uh, coordinating drilling of boreholes for different areas, analyzing the water together with our uh, uh, government water institutions. And then of course, UI University in terms of uh, research on uh, uh, products that you see here in this photo. Like for example, um, uh, this one, this is cactus. Maybe cactus is not very common here in Italy, but we have very good products that you will see. Angela was involved in um, uh, studying a few products because cactus, we make wine, juice, jams, and therefore the, she was involved together with the University of Nairobi to see how best those products are uh, formulated. You see, <clears throat> the project is uh, aimed to promote resilience and the uh, um, self-reliance of communities of like Ipia North. Uh, we live in the north of Kenya, which is drier, but then we, the project was working with 15 groups of 770 individuals through the following activities. But what you will see most is that in Kenya and in, in this part of north where we are working, the, the groups don't own land individually. They live in a big area and then the land is communal. So we live maybe 200 of us, but the land is 12,000 acres, then we live together. 
but this project has been supporting mainly women because we are Maasai and Maasai is a male dominated society. That means it's the man who owns cows, goats, sheep, and other things. The women are left at home mostly to take care of kids, cooking, fishing firewood, fishing water. So we targeted the women to utilize the land to make income so that a difference is brought. Then the men move with the animals from place to place. So these are some of the activities that we have been doing with the project. Mainly we started with training on permaculture, cosmetic formulations, hospitality, and tourism. For those of you who don't know what permaculture is, permaculture is a sustainable human settlement, meaning that we take care of ourselves, how to grow our own food. We also look at the health of the soil. I know you are a student of uh, studying mountains, natural resources, but the soil is what is holding all of us. The soil holds plants, holds water, holds uh, buildings. It's a source of um, building and construction material even fossil fuels we get from there. So without us taking care of the land, then therefore we will not be in existence. So we are looking at the land, we are looking at the people, we are looking at the insects, we are looking at a closed loop system of taking care of the planet Earth. That is the meaning of permaculture. And then now, of course, we can be able to grow things to produce cosmetics, hospitality and tourism. Then we did a lot of uh, follow-ups on the cultivations of different uh, plants that I'm going to show you. We have the aloe, which is a local aloe, cactus, moringa, and a few other staple food for the region. Uh, we did do uh, four boreholes, um, drilling boreholes for four, four communities in different areas. Unfortunately, one borehole was dry, so we didn't get water, but we ended up doing a rock catchment. We have huge rocks, and then we do a tank uh, below, then we harness the rock to harvest the water. Construction of transformation houses for opuntia, or cactus, and honey. Um, I will show you some of the pictures that we have done in the community level, so then they can do semi-processing of the products they get from these plants. Construction of cottages in uh, one of the groups called Tuala, and Laikipia Permaculture Center as part of hospitality and tourism promotion. Promotion and marketing of aloe, uh, puntia, honey, and agricultural products. Uh, aloe is used for cosmetics, and therefore we also do some exports to lush cosmetics uh, in the UK, Germany, uh, Canada, and uh, Croatia for their own uh, development of uh, cosmetic products. The pictures you see here is beehives also. I mentioned already we do honey. So this is local beehives. This is our bee man, Francis Leyangere. And we did provide trainings on beekeeping and the uh, hanging of the beehives. We bought equipment. Uh, when I say permaculture, uh, permaculture also looks at insects. So bees are very important to us because they bring in pollination to the, to the plants. They forage trees, we get honey, we get uh, propolis, we get wax, and then uh, they help the ecosystem. The next slide is uh, actually more on uh, beekeeping, kitchen gardening, and water provision. So the same uh, women groups, you see this, this is local women who are grow, they put up the clothes of Maasai. And then we, this is a bench, that uh, um, a metal bench that we put on these beehives. And then uh, there are big trees that uh, put shade on the, on the bees. Then these stones are just put on top of the, uh, the, the, bee, the lid of the beehives so that wind does not blow the, the cover. We have very strong wind sometimes, so this is how we do it. This is Shuimama Women Group. This lady is a bit of old lady. She's called uh, Kiramatisho from Natu Women Group. Uh, she's tending to her garden in the group level. So they have one, one plot which they share, and then each woman has a section, maybe 20 meters square, to be able to grow her own food. And then you see a shed net up here to protect the garden from too much heat. And then if you are a very keen, you see here, there is no soil. We have covered the soil with mulch. Because as I said, the soil is very important to us. So we don't leave the soils naked. We cover with the dead grass to minimize evaporation. So any little water that goes in the ground, it's kept there for some time. 
for the plants to utilize and also to suppress weeds and just make sure that the soils are protected. Um, here is one of the groups we did a borehole and therefore the Maasai keep a lot of animals. You get one man can have 1000 of these goats, a lot of them. So we provided water troughs for them to be able to also get water for their animals. Tourism and conferencing facilities at the community level. Um, you see here the mountain. It's a mountainous place, so it's uh, subject to your lessons also, and uh, a lot of hills. And then uh, this is one of the cottages that we built in one of the groups. This is Julia Bello, one of the staff of Ipsia that we implement a project together. She's based there. <clears throat> we work every day. These are the women. So th th this, this house has been built out of stones from this hill. So we use stones. Uh, there's a technique that the local builders there use to put stones together and then we use less cement. So we try to use local materials as much as possible. Um, so we did cottages conferencing facilities at the community level to enhance tourism and generating income for the local groups or the local women. <clears throat> this, is, this is a very interesting um, project, maybe for your studies, but we, we call it re like if you had a generative agroforestry project that is running from the year 2020 to this year, July 2023. It's outside the, the, the project we are running. This is not really, it is a, a collaboration between uh, us and uh, a Dutch NGO called Renesha and the Rabobank. Um, we are trying to put up a project. Don't know whether there is a, okay. I was thinking there is um, the, the gate that we do, but this plot from here all the way coming down going all these fence, then this is the fence coming up here, up to here. It's the project that we are running, this plot here. This is not ours. This is not ours. This is where we are. And if you are very keen, you see this plot, she's a neighbor, has many houses, and then the, the garden is just not tilled, it's open. You come to this other plot, the garden has been tilled as you see, but it's nothing because they depend on rains to plant maize. So during the time there's no maize, the garden stays like that. If there's two years down the line, no, no, no rain, no food. The next one, you see they have tilled the land to wait for the rain, the rain is not coming. This is a tilled land, but it looks like just weeds are growing, not much food. This farmer, this is maize. And the, the maize ended up failing because there's no water. So the question is, what is happening here? Here we are doing something we call the food forest. We don't just grow maize. We grow things that take care of the soil ourselves. We call it seven Fs. We bring in plants that are off a story, understory, climbers, nitrogen fixers, uh, plants that bring in forage for the bees, things that bring in firewood. Well, you can do chop and drop or pruning so that you get fouled. And then we also target indigenous uh, crops or trees that are resistant to the drought. So that's why you see this is blooming all throughout the year. These few houses are for our staff, store and the people who are working there. So this project works in partnership with Renesha, promote regeneration of degraded landscape in Laikipia North and is supporting 1,270 farmers in seven of our groups, as well as some of individual farmers. This system is really promotes food security, um, food for foresting, economic uh, resilience, value addition of natural resources, and increase soil carbon. Also biodiversity, water storage and forest. When I say water storage, I don't really mean um, uh, harvesting water from the roof, still okay, but we can also harvest water from the land. If you see here, there is a swell that runs all the way coming here. It runs on contour all the way running here. Several of them, even this one, you can feasibly see it. It means we measure uh, some contours along and then we dig. So if this is the runoff this way, all the water that falls on the land, it's all harvested and then stored here. We call it SSS when it rains, slow spread sink. 
just up here in the mountains, you can also do something like that. So then you reduce the runoff. Runoff is when it rains and then all the water is going with speed, carrying all the soil, carrying many things that they can. So in the garden, we try to do this. This is another one. So any drop that drops in the soil is harvested when it comes to rain. In Laikipia, no, the rangelands, by, we do this by training them on agroforestry, propagating seedlings and growing different species of the trees. This is what I was calling the seven Fs. See here, there is the food because we need food. Our animals need food. We need fruit. We need uh, fodder for our animals. We need forage. We need fertilizer. Fertilizer means we have some plants that have an ability to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere, taking it to the soil. Not all plants have that. Maize, no. Some acacia trees, yes. Some leguminous plants, yes. Even in the forest, when you go up the hill, you can easily identify those plants. And then fiber and then foil. So we call it seven Fs. Now, um, even if we are trying to do uh, food foresting, we need water. And in the dry lands of like Kipia North, water has always been a real challenge because it's dry, the soils are sandy soils. So if it rains, mostly a lot of water go. So we, we ran this project uh, for three years. It has ended in, um, in last year, December. It was 20 months funded by German Cooperation. And the project was to do sand dams. I will show you pictures next, maybe. Uh, no, there, you will see big, big sand dams. But a sand dam is actually a concrete wall built or across a dry gully. So we do a series of them. It means when it rains, we are harvesting a lot of water going down the gully. And then that water is left there for a while. Uh, the, the sand accumulates that water. And then we can build shallow wells. This shallow well is around 15 meters deep. And then it is a hand pump that this woman is just pu pumping water. And then you can harvest water from this side. From where it was very dry, no water. We, we just harness the ecosystem. But also a sand dam is not just for water. It's also restoring the landscapes because the big gullies will start filling up with sand and then they, they level up. So then they don't dig. And therefore we are able to provide and bring back the soils. This project was done in uh, Laikipia, Machakos, Makweni and Kitui. These three counties are in the east of Nairobi. And we had a partnership of uh, uh, Ashenova, which is a German NGO in Kenya. And then Africa Sandam Foundation is an NGO also in Kenya that's having technical uh, advice on building sandams and then ourselves. Plus, of course, the self-help groups of women who are organized to be able to do these kind of things. So sandams bring in food security uh, and other uh, reversing degradation on the landscape. You see, the output of um, most of these projects that we are doing, now I have combined um the, the 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 project that i've just explained the first one here is water supply as you see these women are fishing water out of nowhere and then we do this many of them in different villages so each village has maybe two or three pumps like this and then they are able to harvest the water and then we try also to do exchange programs so that they go to other regions of kenya that these sand dams have worked to be able to to see you know how the land has changed how other communities are building these sand dams. Because the funding we have is not providing um, some local available uh, materials. The communities uh, supply uh, sand because it's there, stones and labor. So the funding we have is only to buy materials that are not in the local area. So what is available in the local area, the communities provide. This is happening because we don't want to bring in what we call dependency syndrome. As you may know, in the third world countries, Africa and many other places, people are used to be given things, but we say, no, we have to be given what we need, what we really need. What we don't need, we provide for ourselves. This brings in something we call ownership. So they own the project. It's not about because someone did it, it's not ours. And then the other output is natural resource management and disaster reduction. Um, this is a a system where we train communities to identify what resources they have, what are the risks, and how they can be able to reduce the risks, especially climate change. 
then uh, three nursery establishment, we have to put seed, seeds to grow the seed, the indigenous seeds that we need ourselves. That's why you see this woman is holding a neem tree, which is medicinal and uh, adapted to the dry land so that they can be able to grow. This is neem tree, this is croton megalocarpus, which is also indigenous and it's really easy to grow. NRM is natural resource management. I think it's also part of your course that uh, we have to identify our natural resources. How do we manage them? Uh, even if we want to use them as, as humans harvesting, are we harvesting some sustainably? Are we losing species in terms of drought, in terms of half harvesting? How do we advise our communities not to do that? Then the other one is holistic pastoralism. We are pastoralists, we are Maasai. These people are uh, animal keepers. So they, they were born and raised, even myself, I was born and raised in the region where uh, the only activity is cow, sheep, goat. Up until I was 10 years old, I didn't go to school. I was telling uh, Angela about the story because my dad and my mom didn't go to school. They were putting on, my mom looks exactly like this woman, although she's old and therefore uh, they don't know the other about education, about jobs, no. But then in this context and this era of climate change, not much grass is available for the animals. So they keep animals for a long time in one place, meaning that the cows, for example, have very strong hooves. So they dig the land and they loosen the soil. And if they do this in one place for a long time, they loosen the topsoil. When rain comes after a couple of months, the topsoil is gone. And you realize if you lose the topsoil, you remain mostly with, most of the time you remain with gravel, you remain with rock. But the question is, grass might not grow in the rocks, but the soil is completely gone, which was supposed to grow the grass. Why? Because of our actions. So this, this subject is about management of the land in terms of how many animals can the land take at any one time. It's about moving the animals from place to place in regards to what is available. And then bring the animals back when the grass is back. But this has been really difficult because the population in Africa is increasing and the land is never increasing. This is a complex subject, but we are trying to, to do it. Then this section is food production and climate sensitive agricultural skills. The Alo Secunde Flora, this farm belongs to Natum, which is one of the groups that we support. The, these plants are actually the aloe secunde flora, which is an indigenous aloe. In the background, you can see beehives. And then you can see a few hills around here. This aloe is what they harvest to make their own products. And then they sell to lush. Um, this area gets really very little rainfall if it comes, but the aloe are resistant and they do very well even during the dry season. It's a magic plant, which when the rain is gone, they close themselves to protect themselves from heat. When the rain is about to come, they open up. So they always tell us that the rain is almost coming. Two weeks, we know the rain is coming, the aloe are opening. So they are also helping us monitor the, 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 the weather because some of the times these weathermen are uh, not saying the truth. They say that the rain is coming next week, it's not coming. So then why can't we use our indigenous knowledge to, to know about this? So most of the time, when I get a phone call, the women are saying, the aloe have opened. Then I write on my Facebook, the rain is coming in a few weeks. And actually the rain comes. So these days they are calling us weathermen. So this is how, <clears throat> uh, this is how we are doing. And therefore um, it's really working very well. The climate resilient project that ended in 2022, December, the Germans, the other partners of ours, they are very happy about the sundams. So therefore, they gave us a, another extension of the project, which is 15th November, 2022 to 2025, meaning that we can continue doing these projects of the sundams and then uh, bringing in other new groups which never got sundams in the, in the other last phase. And this is, uh, is aiming to improve the community adaptive capacity to climate change through addressing issues of water, food insecurity, and environment degradation, same as the, the other one I said. But the beneficiaries here are 270 uh, from six self-help groups. Uh, these are their names, the Maasai names, they're a bit hard, but the groups are located in five group ranches, which include um, 
the Tiamamut Koija and others. Group ranches where communities own land, communally, as I said, but then they choose to form groups to work as, um, as groups. You see, this is what I was saying, Sundams. This is now brings a very clear picture where this is construction. This is a big, big gully running very several kilometers all the way down. Some of them even go to 100 kilometers, big, big gullies. Therefore, we do this uh, concrete wall. You see it, it comes like this one section down, another one, and then this one. This one becomes the spillway overflow of the water. And then you continue doing this all the way. So when it rains from upstream, this sand dam fills up, overflows from this point, goes to another sand dam, maybe 500 meters, fills up like that. So at the end, you have a lake like this from where there was no lake. And then you can easily visibly see it. Um, and then a uh, long time after the rain is gone, you remain with water where water was never standing. And then we develop this shallow well, the one that you saw women are using it. See the communities are full here. They are doing the construction for free. Um, the, 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 this is the sand they are fishing here. If the sand is already there, so we, we don't buy that. We bring them this equipment, maybe cement, maybe metals to be able to do it. So this became a very big game changer in provision of water. And then um, some communities will start farming now and it's just doing very good. And the government is coming strongly to ask us how we are doing it. The government had no idea on how to do sandams. So now they also want to change their strategy to use this one to do sandams, to reduce the erosion, to improve the ecosystem, to provide the water to the communities and also wildlife. Because remember, we have a lot of wildlife for ourselves in Kenya. We have elephants, giraffes, uh, buffaloes, at least also for them to get water, especially during the times when the drought is really long, long, long. And the other strategy is rock catchment, water harvesting. Now this is your subject because you are working in the mountain areas or your subject is that. Um, this is a big rock, you see, coming on this side. It's really big, big. Uh, I know Angela was there, I think, when she visited us, so she has seen this one. This is a 350 cubic water tank built under the rock. And then this uh, is protecting or uh, putting a small fence of rock all the way. So all the runoff from the rock comes all the way to here, and then it's taken to the, to the tank. Then the communities can harvest um, under the tank through gravity. This is a project of one of the women group that you saw them having the aloe. So then they can also use the water for irrigation. You see down here, there is a swell which we dug so when any single drop of water comes, they can also harvest. Look at the landscape here. It tells you something. There's no grass. We can only have these acacias. This is called acacia melivera. They're the only ones surviving because they have a long taproot that goes a few meters down the, the soil. Then they are able to extract water for themselves. Anything that has fibrous roots, shallow roots, no survival because the rain comes maybe once a year. And then you see these small gullies forming. Uh, this is where now finally, these are big gully running here under these trees. And then we have sand dams downstream. And this tank is quite new. We built it with a project that, that has just ended, was funded, funded by Italian cooperation. These are the partners, the, the first uh, um, logo that I showed you. We built it, uh, actually it should be here. So they, they share the same, same rock with this one, with this old rock. They share the same one, but it's on the other side. You see, this is a rock. This tank is on the other side. So we have two tanks sharing one rock, but actually the pipe, the entrance pipe is here. So it goes all the way and then the tank, the, the, the rock is there. So why are we doing this one? It's so simple. You, you don't need the um, fuel, you don't need anything. When it rains, it automatically the tanks fills up then the communities are able to use it without pumping outside the tank. Value addition training and exchange visits. These are our women uh, being trained by an expert how to develop uh, soap, shampoo, shower gel creams out of the aloe. So this is a training that's going on, training them now how to provide their own local cosmetics out of the aloe that I showed you. This picture is uh, Francis Leyangre, on an exchange visit to different groups that we were supporting them earlier 
who are successful. Um, you see, I already mentioned these partners before, but maybe this is the title of the project, our logo, our local government, uh, Renesha, which is supporting the agroforestry, LB Foundation, Rabobank for carbon credits. And then uh, these are the partners now implementing the Sundams project. Ashenova, Africa Sundam Foundation, German Cooperation, and then the other partner who is doing different things. We don't stop from just doing um, charity work. Our approach is also to make sure that we do charity work, we put the infrastructure, but then after three years, communities have to think about business because we cannot borrow funding from development partners forever. We train them on how to do business uh, out of what they grow, the honey, the cactus, the aloe, so that at one point we don't request for funding. This is uh, what we need to speak in Africa where people need to be sustainable. It's not about writing proposals, borrowing, or oh, no. We borrow once, we put a sustainability strategy so that we utilize the first project in making business for our own selves without much support. So this is why we, we, we want to, to, to do business to ensure that the community has sustainability even after donor projects are gone. And this is it, turning a killer plant into, into fusion. So I'm speaking two things here. The business component, this cactus grows there. It's invasive, it's all over. And therefore, one of the principles of permaculture, we say, turn a problem into a solution. We stop complaints. We like complaining all, all, all the time. I don't know here, but in Africa, people like complaining. Uh, complain, you get someone in the morning is complaining, mid-morning, lunchtime, evening, all over. And the complaint they bring is, they always complain about government, they always complain about themselves. You even complain about yourself sometimes how you put a cloth, you complain. We tell them, listen, this plant is invasive, it's fine. It's actually growing all over. It has spikes that if you touch yourself, you will complain for two years because it's, it, it hurts you. If your animals eat it, they swallow, the spikes uh, uh, attack the, the drought, the intestines, and then the animals ooze blood, then they die. So the Maasai were complaining, this cactus is killing our animals. Um, the baboons are, the baboons can easily eat it. <laughs> the baboons don't complain. The elephant don't complain. They eat it easily because they have a strong skin. And then they again spread the seeds on the landscape. So now the people are complaining about the cactus, they're complaining about baboons, about the elephants. No, you see, then we say, well, um, as a center, we said, we need to think about the solution. So we studied this plant and then we found that the fruits, which are this one, the red one, it's very nice nutritious fruit. They can produce, this is the jam, this is the juice, this is actually the wine. So the, the wine has changed now because since we got Angela, the university at Nairobi University, they did a great work to develop the wine to be really nice. The alcohol content is starting, uh, better taste. Our first version was this one, which was like more or less really not very, not, not good. But then we studied the plant and found that it grows by seed and pad. The pad is the leaf where you, you put it down and then it grows. So we said we need to use those two parts. The seed, uh, we have a, a machine that when we put the fruits, you get the pulp going one side, then you make these products. Then the seeds are dried. We, we, we brought in an oil press. It pressed the seeds, then it produces the best oil. Uh, for cosmetics, uh, you can go go maybe cactus seed is the most expensive in the world. Um, it's very 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 good. So we we have a a contract with Lush to buy the oil, which is uh, cactus seed. You got you don't get it in many places. So it means if we crush the seed, it doesn't go to the landscape. So then we reduce the complaint of the people. Then uh, the the pad, we bought a biodigester or a biogas, and then a machine that grinds the, the pads, goes to a biodigester, produces methane gas, and then the communities will start cooking with it, meaning they won't uh, go and fetch firewood or cut trees, but they cook with the green energy, which is very nice. And then what comes out of the biodigester will not grow. 
because it becomes solid like porridge. So then we reduce again the complaint of the people. So us is to try to make people stop complaining. We give them the skills. We tell them that uh, you have uh, to change your mind to stop complain and try to bring the solution. We cannot fix the problems of the planet when we complain every day. We have to think what we can do. The problems are always there, but then if we think creatively, innovatively, how to fix the problem, then it will work. No, uh, the, the enterprises are for sure going on very well. As you see, we, we say UK because Lush Cosmetics uh, is a British company and it's really buying these uh, leaves and supporting the, the women to, to, to integrate the aloe with other food. This woman is actually cutting the aloe with a machete. So then they, they are able to make their own cosmetics and then export the, 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 the leaves. Um, we have this market which has been going on for the last five years, which is really very good with our own aloe but being careful not to finish the aloe. We are doing a propagation and having a lot of seedlings um, to be able to grow in the landscape. This is the finished product. This is the aloe that I was talking about. It's a very resilient um, aloe. It grows even in the wild. It's really very hard and it tells us about the rain, protect itself from um, hard drought and stuff like that. This is the product. This is cream, very nice for the skin. This is shampoo also. This is the soaps, different molds, different shapes. And it's very nice soap for sure. Um, I don't know whether I brought some, but uh, perhaps I will look at it. But um, this is shower, shower, aloe shower, shower gel. And these are the creams. Very nice, uh, very nice products. And they are in the market in Kenya. Also, uh, we have other natural resource-based products, enterprises at uh, like Kipa Culture Center. This uh, same aloe can produce this uh, aloe tea, which is a very good antioxidant and uh, relax, it makes you relax when you drink it as um, black tea. You can add honey if you like, and it's really very nice. And then we have Moringa Oliveira. Vera. I brought a sample of the powder here, maybe if you want to see. But this is really super food that you use it to make uh, to, for food. Everyone can use it. And then we have produced it ourselves. And then it can be, you can plant seeds in between the aloe and so drought resistant, less water. And then uh, there is also this uh, resurrection plant, which is new plant for us. We discovered it, it grows in the mountains and it has very nice aroma. If you smell it, it's very nice. You drink it, it's really very nice. We have not done much research about it, but it's a wild and it's equivalent to rooibos. Those people who have been to South Africa, it's more or less like rooibos, but it's, uh, it grows in the mountains and it can close itself as well. We are yet to explore it. So if you want to look at it, it's there. Um, the honey project, I, I already show, shared you slideshows when we are setting up the project uh, like this one. But at the end, we are able to utilize the honey, as you see, uh, very nice honey. Uh, the, the brand name is Naishamo, which means sweet in Maasai. And then we have Florence, who is a friend of Angela, now putting the honey into bottles, glass bottles, and then uh, ready to go to the market. And now we are happy that the government has approved the use of this honey in the country. We are selling to high-end lodges, so the communities are able to harvest, and then we finalize and put it in the finished form, as you see. So it's been quite, uh, the last seven years has been a big changer for us. We never thought we can arrive to this point, but after stopping the complaints, we arrived here. Um, on the other the part of hospitality and tourism, uh, this is uh, how we are doing our houses. This house has been built out of uh, clay on the area, the walls, as you see. The roof has uh, tash, grass, so we try to utilize uh, local available materials to build. This is also meant for tourists, those who want to visit, and uh, also this is the latest building we have done out of a local stone that's available there, just rooms in the center for people to, 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 to rent out or to sleep, and even at the community level, we have done some of the cottages. 
We also do a lot of trainings ourselves in the center uh, for the general public, permaculture design certificate courses, how you can design your garden, how to control pests, making compost, uh, or even keeping worms, vermiculture, uh, building, value addition of different uh, products. So the center has been used not just by people in Lakipia, even outside the country, even people from Afasi come to train with us on different things. The UN, sometimes they come and they bring people from Somalia, come and train with us, and the East African region. See, these women are uh, happy now harvesting some uh, pigeon pea. You see, this is pigeon pea, which is uh, drought resistant. Uh, this woman specifically is always giving us stories that uh, she has never even planted a seed in her life. But this is the first time they have planted seeds and then they grow. For them, they are animal keepers. So they eat food of animals, meat, blood, milk. And uh, they really don't um, know more about crop production. So uh, if you want, you can get in touch with us. This is our office email address. This is uh, actually, this is my personal number. I just decided to put it there. If you want to get in touch with me, this is our office number, email, this is our website. So you can visit and then see uh, a lot more what we do. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I take it back to Angela. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. As you understand, Joseph is a very, I mean, as a, an enterprise uh, psychology, a lot of things to do. And thank you for these contributions. Uh, just add an information on the YouTube channel of IPSIA. You can find some more videos that have been built with the material from like IPIA and other projects. So you, you can see some more videos and documents. Uh, if you want to go deep. Uh, it's time for some questions. Maybe you, some people can have a question in the auditory or even uh, online. Any kind of curiosity? Anybody that want to smell or to <laughs> say? <laughs> Um, Just open it and you can hear the aroma. I wanted to ask uh, if the community was um, happy with this project, was some, I, I mean, was interested and uh, open to this project or there was some uh, diffidence to, to this? Um, very good question. Um, in the beginning, the communities were having a lot of questions because uh, even to me, uh, some of my friends were asking me whether we want to change the Maasai lifestyle from uh, livestock keeping to crop production. But I, I told them uh, we are focusing on many things, fixing the soils, the degraded soils, taking care of the available natural resources, finding a market, and also trying to bring what we call alternative livelihoods. So because already, as you see, um, the communities are losing a lot of animals that they used to keep because of long, long drought due to climate change. So now they have started to change their mind because they see the groups that are, we are working are generating income out of uh, beekeeping, um, the aloe, the moringa and other things that they have more money than the people who keep animals. So in the beginning, yes, they were hesitant. Okay, what is this? But we knew very well that the fuchsia is uh, not very good for keeping a large uh, number of animals because of less water, less grass. So now uh, we are getting a lot of um, uh, people coming to our gate and asking they want to work with us because they have seen the reality. And also in Africa, people believe by seeing. They don't believe by just this presentation that I'm doing. They want to see, uh, they want to touch the honey. They want to eat, they want to see the plantation. They want to see other people from the local context saying it's working, it's working, which we first of all did by doing demonstration plots with a few groups of people in the community. Then the rest of the neighbors can come and see. And then they say, yes, we want it because so and so we have grown together, born and raised together. It's working for her or him. I also want to do it. So for now it's really um, a, a big excitement, but in the beginning was like, okay, let, let's wait and see what works. Two years, three years down the line, uh, everyone wanted to do it. Even now, there is a, 
an overwhelming call from everyone from the community wanting to, to do this. Thank you. Any other question or comment? I have two questions. Can I? Uh, yes, please. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. Um, so where the, the idea of turning cactus into an opportunity came from? Was it more from the uh, experts uh, or also was there some non local knowledge? And the second question is, um, has the role of or power of women in community land management institutions changed after the Aloe project or not? Thank you. <laughs> Very, good, Very good questions, yes. Um, the idea of innovation of cactus came uh, from a friend of mine from the UK who works with um, Lush Cosmetics because um, Lush um, works also in New Mexico. Then in Mexico, there is a lot of um, cactus growing there. And then in Mexico, they use the cactus for food, for biogas, for uh, for fodder for the animals, and then the rest of the, the products. So when she visited Kenya, she told me, Joseph, you know, we have a project in Mexico that uh, does value addition of such, you know, the, why can't you do it? So we looked online and we found, yes, these people are doing it. And therefore we started uh, doing it. Fortunately, one of our local universities in Kenya was already doing a pilot project of cactus. So they came, we started the project together. So this is, a, I call it connections. Whenever you travel places, you get people with different ideas. They bring in the ideas, you try it, it works. The only issue in Africa is that people don't want to try things. They, they want to hear from other people. So for us, we are a risk takers. We try things that maybe it might work or not, if it works, we adopt it. If it doesn't, then that's it. On the question of the ownership of the women on land management, that is still a challenge. Because as I said, uh, our ownership of land is not individual. We own land as a community. So uh, the women are still struggling, uh, although the law now says that they should also be brought on board for land ownership. Uh, but the men are now convinced because these women are using land better than them. For them, they are keeping a lot of animals that degrade the landscape. For the women, they are integrating the aloe, the bees that don't uh, harm the environment, but it's bringing uh, income for them and restoring the endangered species. So they are, they are, through actions, the women are showing that we can utilize the land much more better than anyone else. So hopefully uh, the law might favor them in the, in the future, for them to own land and also they can be brought on governance of land uh, management in that part of the, of the world. But I'm not saying that um, uh, it's only the part we live ourselves that has that kind of land uh, tenure. The rest of Kenya is uh, land is owned individually. So people buy land and own as a family or something like this. But in the, that part of Kenya, we, we still own land as a communal land ownership. Okay, thank you for your questions. Very interesting questions. Maybe we have another one. Yeah, um, I wanted okay. to, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Then I wanted to ask how the um, integrated pest management works for you, uh, because I think that it could be interesting. Very good. Um, integrated pest management is just managing pests naturally, if I put it in that context, but <clears throat> without necessarily use of chemicals. So we use different approaches, three, three approaches. One, mixed cropping. We bring in a garden, then we bring in crops. In the context of pests, we bring in plants that either repel the pest or attract the pest. Repelling the pest meaning uh, the, the plant might be um, like, like maybe an onion, chili, then the pest don't like it, especially soft-bodied pests. So you plant a line of maize, you know the maize will attract uh, aphids, uh, stock borer or something like that. Then the next one you bring in a plant that that pest does not like. I'm very sure in part of your studies, you know these, uh, these uh, uh, complexities. Then the other one is actually you using those plants that are repellent to the pest, chili, garlic, onion, Mexican marigold, 
I don't know here which plants are repellent. We can be able to harvest them, uh, warm water, put the extracts of the plant inside the warm water, and then we add other things, then we spray. Uh, we use just naturally available plants to to make the the pests not not active and not to kill all of them. And then we can also use other pests to control other pests. I don't know whether my English is very nice, but we use uh, there is soft-bodied pests that exist in the garden, and then there is uh, other insects that feed on them. I give an example. Uh, ladybird. There's a um, you know ladybird. Yes. A ladybird feeds on aphids. So if we have ladybirds in the garden, they can feed on the aphids. But if we use pesticides to spray the garden, pesticides are the conventional pesticides. They kill all of them. Unfortunately, you kill a ladybird, you kill an aphid. So then the ecosystem is not balanced. This is why I was saying in the beginning, we have to respect nature or work with nature because how does nature balance itself in these mountains you see? Nobody is spraying pests there, but the nature just balances itself. We have pests that control, um, I mean, insects that control an insect. So we also introduced that one. And then the last one is um, actually cultural control. Uh, cultural control is where you um, look at the landscape, and then plant crops that are not really attacked by pests most of the time, you know um, that this happens and then sometimes you just use it. So different ways of doing it. But then you have to, 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 to really put a framework in the beginning when you are setting a garden so that you know this pest will come and what you will do. You can still use both. You can still use other insects, cultural, uh, biopesticides. But in your experience, this works. I mean, is it effective as much as you want? Because I think that, yes, we have similar approaches, mm. but mm. sometimes uh, mm. they are not so much success successful mm. so compared to the, let's say, traditional yes. method. So it, what she, she yes. asked is, it, is it okay for you? Is it's, the it's control very, is effective as far it's as It's very know? effective, actually, if you consider it in the beginning, because as I said, you also have to consider it in the beginning when you are setting up your system because you have to apply these things before the pest invest. You don't need to wait until the pests are so much because you might not be able. You have to apply them before. And then the other thing, we also have enterprises which have started in Kenya, which produce natural biopesticides by use of pyrethrum, neem. They actually manufacture it. So you go to the shop and buy them and they are being manufactured out of neem, pyrethrum, and then you apply it. Yeah, mm. and it is another topic that needs time to be exploited. Mm. And then, but gives a lot of ideas about new species or new or old maybe plants that we should uh, mm. study more in this direction for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, I saw the water harvesting structure uh, through which you are building a sand dam and collecting water for the use for community. So I come from India and traditionally we had this kind of a system for water harvest in dry areas, but we are now rapidly losing that, this system uh, on account of they say that it's more expensive to manage this kind of a system. So I wanted to know from you since you have currently done and demonstrated this, is the water harvest through this method sustainable and the supply is enough for an year all year round consumption for the communities and does the maintenance of this kind of a structure also is also cost effective um yeah very good question um for sure a long time people used to manage land uh, differently less uh, animals so then um degradation does not happen so much but then um, sandams is also long ancient practice uh, in different parts of the world. And I want to say that the only hope we have uh, is utilization of such uh, structures to be able to control water uh, in terms of uh, uh, land management. Because now in Kenya, for example, or in even in East Africa, we have big gullies that even if 
you use gabions, maybe no gabions, it will not work because it will be carried by the force of water. Water comes in big volumes and washes away the, the gabions. But the sand dams are constructed in a way that you really have to dig a, a, a long, deep trench. Then you bring in the wall so that then you stretch the arm, you stretch this arm. So then water comes, it's uh, stored like a dam. It doesn't uproot it. Some of the people did uh, small sand dams that have been taken away. And then through this, you need a series of them. So you are able to store more water, restore the ecosystem. Maybe one cannot work because uh, if the gully is long, then uh, it might not be able to work. Maintenance is very simple because it's a uh, quite a huge concrete wall and therefore damage is not uh, feasible. The only thing people need to maintain is the hand pump because uh, the hand pump need maintenance. And that's why we ask the community to contribute the resources so that they own it and they are able to maintain it, they are able to, to put it there. And we are talking about this infrastructure, we are talking about 25 years guarantee, it's there. So sustainability is very, very feasible where we know that it is a long-term project and it's not really, it's quite, it's just like a house. If you build it, you, you are sure. You build a good house, it will stay for a long time. Same with the sand dams. Then during my presentation, I was also pointing about uh, trainings. The trainings, part of the trainings is actually asking these people or training them on how sand dams is built, how they can maintain it. And then we really, the other thing is that we really don't bring expertise from outside. We train our own people how to build it. So they build it, they know how to repair it if there is uh, some damage somewhere, and then they continue doing other sand dams. So this is, this is what's bringing in ownership, sustainability, and uh, also uh, the other uh, governance structures. So it's really community owned, like let's say 98% because uh, the technicians we bring, we always tell them to train the community how to do it. Is the water supply enough for a whole year consumption? In the beginning, no, because uh, we have to wait the rain to come. When the sand dam is constructed new, the rain has to come. Accumulation of sand has to be accumulated in the, in the dam. And then the, the, the seepage of water from the so, sa, sand goes to the well. So we always say new sand dams have to wait for not less than one year to mature, to generate a lot of water. Because remember, the gully was deep, dry, no sand. The idea of the sand dam is that when sand accumulates, sand can store water for a long period of time. Um, then this seepage goes to the well. So the more the sand dam stays, the more mature it is, the more water it can be able to regenerate. And then also, depending with the, how many sand dams you do, because one sand dam helps on another. When the, this one fills up, overflows, goes to another one. So sand accumulates across the ecosystem and then provides water. Just like the forest or the hills, if you destroy the top that will bring in uh, water, then downstream, definitely you don't have water. So it's a sequence of sand dams that can produce water due to accumulation of sand for a long period of time. The more you do it, the more years they stay, the more productive, the more water, the more ecosystem restoration, and then the more humus seed accumulate, the more trees grow. So it's not really about provision of water. It's about ecosystem restoration in many ways. It's about forest, it's about seeds coming up, it's about water, it's about many things. And then also um, reduction of depending of gullies. Okay, please, we have, we have uh, another question. question. Okay, thank uh, you. That's derived from the cactus, like the jam, the wine. Did they find themselves a market inside the local community or are they more related to out foreigner markets? The history of Kenya is that people are, uh, uh, they, they think first before they take new products. They have a lot of questions, just like how you're asking questions now. People ask questions, what is this? What is the benefit? How much is it? So many questions. So the first year of those products, we participated in so many exhibitions in, the, in East Africa, particularly. Uh, exhibitions means if there is like, for example, now in Milan, there is this, uh, is it tourist week or something? Mm. Whenever we hear there is a, there is yes, a, a fair, a fair 
yeah, we participate for awareness of the product. And then we engage the government to give approvals because the, 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 the cactus, the aloe products were new. So the government will, we take it to Kenya Bureau of Standards. They try the formulation and then they tell us it's very nice. Then they give us permits to trade. So the first three years was difficult for sure. There are new products, people are testing it, but now they are gaining popularity as we go on because uh, there's a lot of discovery that uh, cactus trees has uh, medicinal value, especially from the experience of Mexico. The wine, uh, particularly, you know, people like alcohol, of course, uh, um, they, they like to test it. It's actually now the popular product, if I may say, <laughs> because uh, uh, there is no cactus wine, um, if I, even in Africa. So people like to test something new. Uh, all our products now are sold locally. There's no international market except the aloe leaves. Uh, all of them are, are local. And we like it that way. We will uh, be hesitant to go to the international market. We know there is premium price and all these kind of things, but we want to concentrate the local market because we are sure that even during emergencies like COVID and other, other situations, we can exist. And therefore, uh, if an international market comes later, fine. But for now, I think we are really concentrating on the, uh, on the local market. But yeah, you always find... Uh, you always find people coming and they ask, I will buy this and put it in my backpack and they, I take it back yes, home. It's not a big market, but <laughs> yes. it's going to increase according also to the tourism mm -hmm. development. Yeah. It is local tourism, but I mean, for that kind of communities, for that kind of villages, probably it's not important mm -hmm. to have a so big market, but mm -hmm. just to... Uh, have a, the, I, I suggest that the increasing of quality can be a switch for the economic and income to, to try to refine the product in order to be more interesting compared to many other local products that you can find. This could be a, a mm. future. Okay. So I, I think we have to go, but if you have any other question, we can answer. Or if not, I really thank you again, Joseph Lentunoy, for this speech. Mm. Thank you all of you for your questions and stay in contact. He will be in Milan until uh, uh, Sunday. And then, uh, but you have that contact. So in case uh, you want to know more about Kenya, you can ask. Thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you, Travis.